Do you love the Venture Brothers cartoon, but are afraid of missing the plethora of historical references and layers of meeting behind each episode? Join pop culture and history experts Ilana Levin and Stephen Atwell. P.S. His secret identity is that he's an actual historian. For our Venture Bros podcast examining each hit TV show episode. We're covering the series finale today, Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart. This marks the 20th anniversary of the show and our seventh year of coverage. This piece was recorded during the 2023 Writers Guild of America and SAG After Strikes. Without the labor of the writers and actors, the Venture Brothers would not exist. Steve is a former union activist, staffer, and union elected, and I'm a former union communications director. So it's important for us to make sure that we're in the clear to do this podcast, because I know there's been some confusion among fans about how critics are supposed to interact with material that we cover during the strike. First off, Screen Actors Guild and all of them cleared us to do this podcast. Thanks to their very diligent communication staff for answering our questions quickly and clearly. But the unions are counting on all of us, fans and critics alike, to do our part to support the strikes. The number one ask has been to remind folks they can donate to the Entertainment Community Fund on their website to support both the workers who are on strike and other folks working in the entertainment industry who can't currently work because of the strike. There's other pop-up fundraising that's happening online and elsewhere that you can find, but the Entertainment Community Fund is always a safe bet. If you live in New York City, LA, Atlanta, or a few other key cities, the unions want you to help on the picket lines. Visit wgacontract2023.org for details. That's wgacontract2023.org, and you can stay up to date on the strikes by following the guilds themselves directly on the Writers Guild contract site and on sagafterstrike.org, which also lists the SAG and AFTRA picket lines for the and other locations around the country. If you too happen to do freelance critical or journalism work, you can get more information and participate in that through the Freelance Solidarity Project, freelancesolidarity.org. We're entering a time period where the studios are going to attempt to pit fans against the people who make the shows we love. Do not fall for it. The unions are out there fighting for the continued existence of the stories and media we love. The companies are the ones who are taking down the shows we enjoy and trying to replace the artists we respect and appreciate with robots. We stand with the workers. So join us. And with that, we'll be talking about the themes of this episode. This being a series finale, I think that we're just going to go and don't jump right in full spoilers. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you've watched the finale. It's <laughs> So we'll be going in deep here, talking about all the references and themes from the series. And we're going to start with that now. Okay, so the first theme that we want to talk about is following on from the series exploration of nostalgia and our sort of emotional and historical relationships to pop culture is whether we have to move on from our childhood obsessions as we see from the examples like Hank choosing to leave his altars behind accepting the watch, accepting that he's never going to learn who his mommy was, and Bob's lesson with the watch about choosing your family rather than being obsessed with blood relations and family trees. Bob is the neighbor who looks like the Big Lebowski, because I had forgotten about who he was. He's a great character, though. He's voiced by the excellent J.K. Simmons. Mm -hmm. Or whether we should come full circle as we see with Ventec Towers ending up transplanted from New York City back to the old venture compound in Colorado, and Dean's statement to his father that if he'd stayed in New York, home wouldn't be where home was. So what do you think about that? I wasn't sure how I felt about things going back to Colorado in the end, but I think that there is some really cool parallelism that demonstrates growth that we see that was 
in the very end of this episode, because when the series begins, I was a bit surprised to see the Ventec building end up back in Colorado again, because that feels like the sort of reset that you don't do at the end of a series. But they definitely did it in an entertaining manner. I think a real way that the finale connected to the very first episode for me was has to do with a certain combination of blood donation bags. Namely, in the first real episode of the show, the episode ends with Doc Venture having taken a forceful kidney donations from both of his sons and hooked up to some blood transfusion bags and having taken advantage of his kids' bodies, basically as organ farms. And then in the finale, it ends with Rusty donating blood to his arch nemesis. And so that kind of echo, that kind of echoing of the beginning of the series in the finale, I think really does point to growth in a way that transcends the question of whether they are in the same physical place as they were before or not. They're definitely dealing with a rusty who's been on enough of a journey to not be quite the dick he was before. Yeah, I think that's a good point, which is I don't think we should expect Hammer in public to outright call for the putting away of childish things, because if that love wasn't there to begin with, this series wouldn't exist. But I think you are right that like you are returning to the place. It's almost a hero's journey thing, right? Mm -hmm. You are returning to the place you came from with greater wisdom and understanding, still doing the things that you love and that you find meaning from, but hopefully with a greater sense of proportion. Yeah. I I really do hope that Dean gets to go back and finish college and then we just, we won't see it. You and Doc both. Yeah. I I feel like that's something that he actually wants, like genuinely, but it definitely... I definitely love the finale. It was very emotionally satisfying. I wish that we'd gotten to see all the additional work that the team that wanted to offer that they were not able to do, unfortunately. But for wrapping up a 20 year series in a short movie, they really did an amazing and impressive job. Yeah. I mean, I think that they are really as fans themselves, like interested in that question of what is the right balance of your childhood obsessions and continuing those versus moving on. And we see that echoed as well in those debates about pop culture obsession and arching. We see some real parallels drawn between the, between the monarch and Gary, like they're having an argument over whether the song Roxanne was by police or Toto. They're thinking of Rosanna by Toto, which is, it was so interesting. You were actually were pointing out to me, Stephen, that so often the de- pop culture debates that happen between characters are arguments that Jackson Public and Doc Hammer have had between each other. And I think that really is true. But this one with the police and Toto, I was like, no, I can't believe that they would actually get that confused between the police See, and Toto. I'd be willing to bet a small but significant amount of money that it is just because they've been very open in the past about borrowing from their nerd fights. And if they're willing to argue about whether Smurfette is a mammal or a egg laying species, like this, this is not dumber than that. I guess, but come on guys. The fact that like they, The question is like digging into these fights and insisting on winning in them. The monarch talks about how he realized at some point in that debate that he was wrong, but he just couldn't like, he just couldn't let it go. And that really is one of his defining characteristics as a, as an antagonist is he, and he says it in in a couple other ways too. Like he just, he he keeps digging in. It's funny though, because usually when you dig in, it's because you're actually right and you can't let it go. It's something inconsequential and you're right and you can't let it go. I mean, I would say that this is a fault I recognize in myself. Yeah, very much the same. Like, I will dig in when it's something that I'm right about, 
or sometimes when I'm wrong about. Like sometimes it's about not wanting to admit that you're wrong. And sometimes it's almost like wanting to see if you can get away with being wrong just by being a better debater than the other person. Mm. But I also think like the other parallel, right? The other example where the monarch digs in is his toxic resentment of his wife and the guild, mm. right? Where he says like, basically she's getting in the way of his sort of self-expression and self-actualization in a way that is like very reminiscent of like men whose wives careers get more successful than their own and what's interesting is i'm not sure again where we're meant to land because it is a positive sign that the monarch steps back from destroying his marriage mm-hmm. and like because it was dicey there yeah yeah and apologizes to his wife but at the same time like when dr mrs the monarch has that really great speech that she gives about like recharacterizing his his obsession with dr venture as something mythic, right? As this Mm -hmm. struggle between the better and worse halves of your own nature and says that the monarch is the better side. I think it's partly a recognition that like underneath all of the worst worst aspects of Mm -hmm. nerd culture that we have seen, you know, ever since Gamergate, but there was there on a local level of like gatekeeping and bullshit within nerd circles since forever, right? That underneath all of that, like those thick layers of barnacles is this like sheer passion and commitment that is beautiful in its own way. Yeah. She's also pointing to that the monarch stands for something and what he stands for is being against this other man, but there's a there there sort of, and she she finds that compelling. Like he has a mission. He's sort of the opposite of a punch clock villain. Yes. And you know, that he has a calling. The whole fact that in the end, the question for both Rusty and the monarch is, are you your own worst enemy? And then it becomes literally, yes, your arch enemy is a clone of you. But there's also literally yourself, like the way that each one of them undermines their own success. Yeah. By sabotaging themselves in different ways. And I, I, you think about what else they could be, cap- what else the moniker would be capable of doing if he wasn't obsessed with destroying Dr. Venture and the Dr. Venture is it be, uh, being his own worst enemy in the sense that he's half assing his half assedness and laziness really keeps him from reaching his own potential And with the monarch is incapable of half-assing or lazying anything. He is 100% all the fucking time. It's just pointed in a direction that's insane versus (laughs) the vet versus Rusty. who's was like half-assing things in a direction, but about things that are not shitty. So that's, I think the two sides that they're representing the other, the utter conviction of the monarch. That's the utter conviction of something that's completely ridiculous. And then the half-assed, science-ness and half-acid parenting of Rusty Venture. Like science and parenting being two things that are good, but he just fucking half-asses it. I think that's a really good point because there's an interesting moment late in the film where like Rusty and the monarch are talking about their enmity. And Rusty Mm -hmm. says he hates the monarch, but that he doesn't make it his life. Yeah. Which is a sign of maturity, right? He's got other things outside of arching he's got his business and he's got his son now as you said he kind of half asses both right he's he's cutting corners right to just not put as much effort in and what is nice in this in this movie is that even though rusty ultimately is responsible for the danger to originally New York and then 
Colorado, right, by mm-hmm. inventing this like incredibly powerful magnetic super collider and stuffing it in a consumer product unnecessarily. <laughs> he probably didn't and, even invent it. He's reusing his dad's super collider and micro sizing it to fit it in a home consumer product. Yeah. But in the moment of decision where like he can either get on the ship and leave the vent tech tower or he can stay and fix the problem, right? When Billy says you have to step up, he chooses to risk his life to save people from destruction rather than saving himself, which is legitimately an act of heroism that we haven't really mm-hmm. seen from him before. Yeah. Right? It's something that he's always resisted. Part of, I think, his half acidness is that he is this sort of jaded, traumatized ex child star who can't take the world that he grew up on in seriously anymore. And it's like, this is a moment where he's within the context of the universe. No, this is real. You actually have to take this seriously. He's called upon to do that. And Billy is such a great character. Billy has been pushing for his better angels, like really by and large, but for the better angels, really the whole time in the recent seasons, especially. I would say that Billy's kind of defining characteristic pretty much from the beginning is that he is an idealist. He's a true believer. And it means that he's not willing to cut corners. He's Rusty's real fan too. And like he has an idea of what he thinks Rusty can be having grown up watching that Rusty show. And he knows that's not what Rusty is, but he has an idea of, well, like we could try. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Then the next theme that I thought we could discuss that runs really throughout this episode in all kinds of different complicated angles is the idea of tortured family relationships, which has been a running theme on the show since the beginning, and whether they are as bad as we think. Probably following on from the end of last season, we should probably discuss Hank and Dean, whose like relationship had become fractured by Dean sleeping with Hank's girlfriend. And who had um, become, as Dean says to his brother in the hospital, like they had become fractured even before that, really, which is what I think is really compelling. Because this happens, this, like they, in the beginning of the series, they were really clones of each other and there wasn't much distinction. And as they formed their own identities, and they realized all the ways that they were different. And they just stopped interacting as much. And I mean, having just recently rewatched those episodes of the Dean's confessional letters to his brother, they're so freaking good. I actually recommend folks, if you haven't watched those for a while, go back and watch those, listen to our episode coverage of them. But this show, like this ending is really about building their reunion after that separation. Yeah. And so ultimately, right, what happens is Dean goes on, well, Dean goes on this rescue mission to bring Hank out of Coma World. And in return, Hank saves Dean from Hank's altars, right? Who represent his his more vengeful, resentful side. And they leave it at Dean admitting that like he totally deserved to to get beaten up for having done a pretty despicable thing to his brother. But like, ultimately both of them realizing that they love each other and they're they're like, they want to be brothers. Yeah. Oh, did you notice the whole, like Hank has that four colored pen that folks used to have. They kept thinking he was clicking between those four colors and the four different personalities that he's, that he's playing with the noir, the, the noir detective, the bat. Russian Gaevich and Enrique Matassa. And so it's like the four personalities for the four colored pen. <laughs> yep. It was very I haven't nice seen time. one of those in a long time. Yeah, they're still around. You can still get them <laughs> at local stationery stores. I believe it's a really, I thought it was a really good reconciliation they had in the end. Yes, I agree. And is again, nicely parallels what we'll get into with Rusty and Malcolm. 
So next, I think we should talk about the like the big reveal character and the primary mm-hmm. antagonist character for the episode who we haven't really brought in mm-hmm. yet, which is Bobby St. Simone and Debbie St. Simone, who had been mentioned previously on the show, but who's had never been shown and whose true story gets completely rewritten in this episode. When I had heard that they were introducing a new villain in the finale of the series, I was just like, that's insane. I mean, I knew it had to be someone who was connected to either it was going to be their mom or whatever, something along those lines, but I still was like a whole new character, but they did a great job. They made it work. (laughs) Like it's this incredibly well-made show. Yeah. I'm really fascinated by Mantilla. Interestingly, she's yet another woman with invisible girl powers. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about what is the significance of her name. Mantilla would be the Spanish pronunciation. And it's those veils that they would wear in like flamenco dancing and medieval Spanish women. And I was thinking about how a veil like uses used to conceal identity. And maybe that's what the name was basing off of because we see her in that with the mantilla of sorts on in her costume from the beginning of the time that we see her, but we don't know what her powers are. Like her real actual power being that invisibility power is concealed yeah, until she reveals it later. So that's our best guess at the significance of the character name. So with, I, I'm going to take Bobby first, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with Bobby, what's interesting is that she's been mentioned in the past as the mother figure, right? And like her job in the in this episode is to do a retcon and explain to Hank that she is not Hank and Dean's mommy, and that in fact. She's not Rusty's mommy either. And even though, like, she was romantically entangled with Jonas Venture Sr. And there is a kind of an interesting parallel in both cases, in that, like, she is simultaneously both a mother and not a mother, right? Mm -hmm. She's definitely a mother to Debbie, but Mm -hmm. she is not a mother to any of the Ventures. And it's this kind of weird, like quasi incestuous, but not actually incestuous kind of relationship that then gets reparalleled with her daughter Debbie. Yeah, yeah. No, it is fascinating how they keep getting tangled in each other's lives in those ways as well. But I thought it was fun, like the way the show had the action man as his character in Barbarella like repeating the name for the viewer so that we could be like, oh, right, we heard that. Oh, right, we heard that. Yeah, I liked her clarifying, I'm not, I am a mother, I am not your mother. <laughs> and, but there's so much tension, family relationship clash and tension between Bobby St. Simone and her, and and Debbie St. Simone. We actually, I believe both of them make offhand remarks to kicking something in the throat meat or something in the throat meat. And that's actually a good sign we get that, oh, this is her kid. Because that's not a normal thing to say. But it's one of those moms trying to make their kids a star or get them into their business kind of a kind of a story. Yeah. And it's a very Mm -hmm. tortured relationship between the two of them. Because Debbie very much resents her mother Bobby for having taken her away from the world of supervillainy and stuck her in a, what's the name of the Netflix documentary? Tiger? Tiger King. Oh, it's not though. This is an actual real rescue for, this is more like fruit in the arms of an angel. Like that whole. But isn't she also dressed like the woman from the, I thought it was a reference anyway. Don't, I didn't see a Tiger King. I thought it was like the real genuine, like animal rescue thing, but I haven't seen Tiger King. Okay. There's basically ads for like animal sanctuaries and rescues that, and guys, you got to be aware. Some of them are not what they appear to be, but I love the idea of an animal rescue for former supervillain or superhero sidekick eyes mutant animals. And 
Bobby very much resents that. And at the same time, the, the fact that she gets her powers from her mother, there's almost a sort of a Freudian thing going on there. Right. But at the same time, the powers were something that like Bobby never wanted and that like yes. really screwed up her life. Whereas they are very much like wanted by Bobby. So it's at the same time, almost like an act of restitution. No, I mean, I love it. Of course, an actress doesn't want to be made invisible. And of course, a wannabe supervillain would find that to be a handy set of powers to be having. I just think it's so interesting that we have two, well, three really invisible women in the Venture Brothers, like the Marvel superhero character, but that's a a power skill set that Jonas and other male scientists seem to keep putting on women. And then similarly replicating the kind of not actually, but incesty thing is the relationship between Debbie St. Simone and Rusty and the Monarch, which turns mm -hmm. out that Debbie didn't actually have an affair with Rusty, which we learn was like a, a major part of the monarch's grievance against Rusty. And that like Debbie is also not related to either the ventures or the monarch, or I guess that's duplicative, but is the egg donor to Hank and Dean. So she's again, quasi a venture, quasi not a venture. And at the same I mean, time, like, She's clearly a donor who does not want to be seen as a mom. And she keeps saying that to them. And that's just the reality of that for a lot. Like I have, I have friends who are like egg donors and they're like, yeah, not the mom. That's not their, that's not what they're doing. And I really liked the show respecting that and also not making it like a huge weird thing. There's so many huge weird things and this isn't one of them. Yeah. And likewise, they swerve away from the obvious plot by having initially it appears that Debbie is obsessed with the monarch and trying to break up his marriage. And then what you find is that she's actually obsessed with Dr. Mrs. The Monarch mm -hmm. in a very like single white female kind of way that like she wanted the two of them to be a duo instead of at the time, Dr. Girlfriend, being the number two to a series of incompetent men. But at the same time, rather than have some sort of tragic conclusion, like Debbie ultimately decides to accept a limited victory, right? She takes becoming an actual, I guess we'd call it a union supervillain <laughs> by signing up with the peril partnership in Canada, rather than pushing her, girl boss versus glass ceiling war to the logical conclusion and like really trying to essentially poach or really privatize the arching industry. Yeah, that's that that's what it really looks like. And I know we'll be talking about that theme in a little while, but I think that's a great description. Yeah, I really appreciated the subversion of the expectations that everything is about the men in that way. It is actually all about the men in terms of the familial relations, but the rivalry and the jealousy is not about men and women's romantic attraction or love at all. It's about a woman who like wants to BFF this character, Sheila, who like I would imagine every supervillain probably wants to be like her. So of course she wants to be. I like that she didn't get kicked out of the side of a plane or anything like that, despite the fact that you could easily imagine that have happening to her after what she pulled. I think about the run. Everybody who's telling Sheila to run like knows she didn't really do it, but they have to play along with this charade. There's so much of we have to play along with this charade that happens in this show. That's one of the show's themes, frankly, is having to play along with a set of roles that might not actually make sense that everybody knows are manufactured, but have to be played anyway for reasons. I think, well... I mean, we see so much in this episode of both OSI and the Guild working together in essentially like collusion of managing the nemesis trade, as it were. 
Yeah, it's it really puts feel- vaguely in mind of the way that uh, Stockton Rush talked about like established players trying to keep out innovators in that Arch is positioned as like the Silicon Valley disruptor force to to their kind of arrangement. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But yeah, no, that's right in there. What do you think about the decision to have Rusty and the Monarch be clones of each other, not just brothers, but like straight up clones? I really like it. I think it is a kind of neat super science twist on what everyone thought the plot arc was going to be. People have been calling that the two of them were brothers for seasons and seasons. At this point, many years. And it's another level of parallels with Hank and Dean, right? Who are both twins and clones. And at the end of the day, uh, an identical twin kind of is like a natural clone, you could say. Sure. I liked it. I think, and we'll get into this in a sec, it's partly interesting for what it tells us about, about Jonas and his decision from the past. And I think the gag of the baboon DNA being added to prevent male pattern baldness Mm-hmm. But producing aggression is a fun explanation for like why one clone goes good and the other goes bad. I mean, you think about like Cable and Strife from the X Men, mm-hmm. similar kinds of dark mirror antagonists. Well, obviously, you can just have a nature versus nurture argument about that as well. But but I, I did have to think about like why a baboon specifically. There's so so the monarch butterflies turned him to evil. Yes. I'm just joking. They raised him that way and they're in sectoid ways. No, but yeah, I, I was thinking like, why a baboon though, per se, since there's so many animals that don't go bald. In fact, most animals don't go bald, but it is a f- funny description. Given the fact that they're raised separately, I don't know how much of a difference it makes that they're clones versus brothers, since the whole thing is that they do, they have, they are related and they'd have different childhoods. Yeah, I mean, it mm-hmm. reminded me of the way that separated identical twins are used to measure, like, genetic versus environmental Actors, effects yeah. on things like alcoholism and addiction and other kinds of illnesses. They actually aren't supposed to let that happen anymore. And so I imagine all of those sorts of studies will eventually die out which is good because people shouldn't be separated from their siblings. <laughs> but I think it's a timestamp of the period in, in which that could even be said to have been the case. And scientists have been obsessed with twins in creepy and abusive ways. Oh, yeah. Forever, basically. Anyway, no, I thought I, I was impressed by the reveal. I don't know how the monarch process is being part monkey. I mean, we are all monkey, but... Yeah, monkey I mean, I think it's mainly there as like a gag. Next thing that I want to talk about, I mean... Okay, briefly, I just want to mention that there is this, speaking of tortured family relationships, this weird repeating trope of venture brothers sleeping with the significant other of their brother. Because, obviously, like, Rusty has all kinds of hang-ups about his dad... But then there's the whole thing where Malcolm thought that Rusty had slept with Debbie and then Dean actually sleeping with Hank's girlfriend. And was and Hank sleeping with the fan club girl, Fictal, who his dad had slept with before. Right. And I think, as you said earlier, you're right in that, like, it's really more about the relationship between the men than their relationship with any of the women. Like, it's very noticeable. All of the girlfriends drop out of the narrative. The thing, right? Like, one of the reasons why they all sleep with the same women is because they don't have that many women. So if there aren't that many women in the story and you want to have women who are significantly part of the plot string some of these things together, then you're going to be going through the same women. Sure, that's true. Isn't I just meant, else? like, they don't come yeah. back into the narrative. Like, we don't see... Mm-hmm. 
Hank's girlfriend chime in to say what she thinks about the whole situation between Hank and Dean. Oh, we know that Doc and Jackson wanted to have more stuff with Serena and the finale. That's one of the things they've spoken about. And I'm very curious what that would have been. Yeah. Yeah. They would have wanted to see that sort of resolved. But as it stands, it does feel a little bit more like the existence of a girlfriend in question is a pretext or a a catalyst for like Mm -hmm. a, a crisis in relationship between male siblings, which is... Yes. Yes, or fathers and sons, yes. Yeah, and it does kind of follow, and this was something that I talked with you about earlier, like this weird fact that none of the ventures have conventional nuclear family structures, right? We don't know who Rusty's mom is, and given the nature of super science in this world, there may not have been one. Hank and Dean are gestated by their father, if Mm -hmm. not provided the eggs by their father. It is very like Zeus and Athena. Mm -hmm. Oh, and of course, Jonas Jr. too, as a a child who is birthed as well. Yeah, exactly. It's a child who was birthed by his brother, effectively. You're right. Like I think the Greek god uh, parallel that you drew is really interesting and i think like with these being people who are obsessed with like logic and thinking having them burst full grown from zeus's head like athena sounds like exactly what they would have wanted to have happen yeah i yeah i assume that rusty is a quote-unquote defective clone of his dad at this point that's quite possible. It might explain why dad is such a dick to him is because he's not the same as himself. He was looking yeah. for a mirror of himself and his son isn't him. And so for therefore his son is a disappointment and he can't. Yeah. yeah. Jonas Sr.'s level of disappointment in Rusty really reflects the idea, the notion of him being a man who expected his son to literally be a reflection of him. So I think it makes a lot of sense to presume that Rusty is somehow a quote unquote defective clone of his dad. Yeah, And it's cool that then Rusty didn't want to pass that clone burden to his sons, and he had his sons through a different scientific practice, basically. Well, I mean, he did clone them over and over again. That's true, as clones themselves. Yes, but they're they're not clones of him. Yes, that is true. Following up from the Athena thing and the link to super science, right? Athena is the goddess of wisdom, And, like, famously in the Oresteia, like, she is the deciding vote in what is ultimately a question of who is more important, the father or the mother, and gives this explanation that is essentially a woman is merely a passive vessel for the man's life essence. And I, because I, Athena, was birthed solely through, through Zeus... And so there is that association with birth without mothers representing sort of wisdom and reason as opposed to like the more chthonic relationship of like blood and the natural process of childbirth. Yeah. So the final thing that I thought we should discuss in this section is the way in which the sort of the retcons make us rethink whether tortured family relationships are as bad as we thought they were. So in this episode, right, the things that we learn show both Jonas Sr. and Rusty not being as bad in their private lives as we had thought. So Jonas is absolutely a bastard to Bobby St. Simone in his super science, super heroic life by experimenting on her, fucking up the experiment, and then forcing her into espionage. But, like, he didn't actually cuckold the blue morpho, although they were swingers, so, like, whatever. 
Like, and instead, it was ab- above the board rather than below the board. Yeah. yeah. And instead gave his clone son to a childless couple who couldn't conceive and wanted to have a child. I mean, he still does held it over the blue morpho, though. He literally is, you better do something for me because I gave you something. It just happens to be that something is a son that he wanted. Yes. I mean, he was also blackmailing the blue morpho about them having, filmed themselves having affairs with underage women. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Like, they're still, they're less bad in their private lives. They're not bad. And likewise, Rusty didn't have an affair with Debbie but instead traded her mother's superpowers for Debbie's eggs to produce Hank and Dean. And there's a really interesting line when he doesn't end up telling them the truth, but he says, whoever bore you loved you very much, which is a backhanded way of admitting that he actually cares for his sons. Mm, You had a very good point about consent in all of this. Do you want to touch on that? That it's really clear that for once... Rusty went to the step of getting very clear expressed consent from Bobby about using her genetic material to create the boys. There's so many times where you see people messing with other people's DNA and experimenting them not consensually. And it was refreshingly human and non douchey of Rusty to ask her first and not just randomly knock her out with chloroform and steal her eggs while she was asleep or anything like that. Yeah, which is definitely what a season one Rusty would have done. Totally. So I think it's like a nice note that the boys aren't made from like DNA that was stolen, rather DNA that was given. Yeah. Speaking of douchey behavior, shall we talk about the other through line, thematic through line of the episode, which is Silicon Valley tech bro bullshit. What timing for this theme to be talked about? Yes, between... Perhaps we'll tweet about it on the Twitter (laughs) social media site that still exists that is called Twitter. Well, as long as we don't go down in the submarine. Um, Yeah, I love that this show hates the tech bro delusions as much as we do. And we see them going after it from all around, both when it's coming from Debbie and her fake startup, as well as all of Doc Ventures' fake Apple bullshit that he pulls in this episode. Let's address these one by one. So the inciting incident for this episode is that Rusty and Ventec are going forward with the helper pod, which is like yet another one of these home speakers that spies on you so that you can mm-hmm. give it voice commands and ultimately exists as a loss leader to encourage ever-increasing consumption, which turned out to be a failure in almost every case. Like, all of these things, Alexa, Siri, Google Home, etc. Like, they all lost huge amounts of money because people just use them to turn the lights on and off and play music without having to push a button instead of ordering toilet paper or whatever. And what's so interesting, you're right, I had forgotten that those devices were being sold as a loss leader by those companies. I had totally forgotten that. There have also been some troubling cases of the audio being, like, acquired by police without warrants, which is troubling from a a privacy and civil liberties perspective. And just as a, a further nod to this, notably throughout the episode, Sea Captain is dressed in the same black turtleneck blue jeans that Steve Jobs and Mm -hmm. also Elizabeth Holmes made their sort of uniform, their speed suit. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) their speed suit. And then on the other hand, we have Arch as a deliberate evocation of the movie The Social Network and the social media company, Facebook, right, where we even see Debbie celebrating a leaderboard clicking over to 100,000 successful arches, as happens in the movie. And the contrast between this sort of sleek, app-based, high-tech approach to arching and the goofier, old-school ways of the guild. And notably, 
arch ends up being a con and a sort of a hollow evocation of the glossy camp of the Schumacher Batman movies. While the guild, for all its flaws, and Dr. Mrs. the Monarch says the guild has problems, but we need to, to work to fix them, to make it better, has its roots in the genuine kind of craft and love of the golden age of comics and the golden age of animation, right? With the reference to both anvils and a giant glove on the spring. Yeah, that was fun. I loved that scene of her taking the, like literally the Christie Street path train station. And this show has so much fun with the path train and making it into her sort of floor show, almost her floor show to demonstrate her performance of mastery of these powers Yeah, and that as a disruptor, she actually ends up just like breaking a critical piece of public infrastructure. That was such a great line when he's like, that train's not going to come after all that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's a good moment. Yeah, point about the app. Oh, yeah. So what's so fun about the app is that it automatically, you download it because you think it's going to make things easier and then it steals all of your data and you can't really control what it's accessing or how it works. And that's all very much like how Apple's products are. My my husband is a computer engineer, which means that whenever he has to interact with Apple devices, he screams at them a lot because they don't let you go in and do things yourself. The Apple the Apple design philosophy is that we know what you want, so we're going right, to do this for garden. you. And w- walled garden, and you can't figure out how to do it. You're not allowed to go and dig into the back end yourself. It just does it all. So if you're someone who actually does know what you actually want to do. The Apple is, technology is literally hostile to you doing it. So it makes sense that she's definitely visually aping Apple logos and the white, very white aesthetic. And similarly to Apple, it's, I mean, we're going to just take the data we want and we're not going to let you control access to anything yourself. Yeah. And it's also that you can just push one button and the thing is done, but then you don't know what it is. It's like a mystery box. Mm -hmm. The idea is that the end user doesn't need to understand and maybe shouldn't understand how Arch works. And that's 100% Apple's design philosophy and why actual engineers hate it. Yeah. And what I was going to add to that is like, similarly, the fact that Debbie is able to double cross the Monarch and Gary by just delisting them from the app after they've gotten into the building. I think it's like a very good example of how one of the things that all of these kind of, you know, not just the gig economy apps, but especially those, right, put all of the decision-making power and flexibility onto the company. So that they decide when you're allowed on and when you're kicked off Mm -hmm. and they can use and abuse that power however they like, which is very different from a more traditional labor constitutionalist paradigm like the guilds of calamitous intent, right? Mm -hmm. Which if it's anything like the unions that I worked for, right? It's got a constitution. It's got bylaws. There's an internal grievance procedure you actually have rights where you can challenge while compared to the sort of labor constitutional constitutional institution like the guild of calamitous intent for all its flaws if it's anything like the unions that i've been a member of and that i worked for right they have constitutions they have bylaws there's an internal grievance process right there's all of these democratic rights to challenge those above you that do not exist in capitalism, whether it's Silicon Valley or any other corporation. One thing about Debbie I want to add is I find it fascinating that Gary wants to talk to the mystery woman on the path train platform and the monarch is making fun of Gary for being interested in her. So that's almost, there's how dare you bring an additional woman into the closed circuit of the world in which these characters exist and interact. Gary is a fanboy, so he wants the fanboy out about the clear supervillain or superhero, and he doesn't know which way she could be. Flying colors, as it were, in the subway. And Monarch is another person. Do we have to interact with other people? At least that was my read on it. Do you have yeah, any Yeah, I mean, about it was. That? So I would say part of it is that, like, at the end of the day, the Monarch does view Gary 
as a fanboy as opposed to a creator. And so the monarch wants to play it cool, but at the same time, there's also, because he compares it to getting her number, right, the fact that she's the monarch's ex-girlfriend makes it further awkward, right? That, oh, does this mean that my ex is interested in, let's be frank, his only friend? And overall, the kind of the awkwardness of the ex, who is also a direct competitor to my wife, is like making a play, and is she interested in Gary, or is she interested in me? Yeah. And, and there is a parallel being drawn to like the monarch's loyalty to the guild and his loyalty to his wife. Yes. Especially since she is, she really represents the guild to them. I thought it was going to be like a Hank goes to find America kind of storyline, but it actually is just Hank doing a finding America to find himself storyline, which was again, like self-reflexive enough to make sense within the show. I never thought. Well, and also road trips are always about the journey of the soul. In terms of the last the time they went on a road trip in that way, they both got blown up at the end of Easy Rider, as we discussed in the most recent episode of the podcast that we recorded. Yes. So I think now we are going to be going into the part where we're going to just dive into all of the different references in this movie. And boy, were there a lot and uh, help you pick those out. Take it away, Stephen. So I'm going to start with the episode name, Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart. This is a reference to one of my favorite songs by Paul Simon, The Boy in the Bubble and The Baby with the Baboon Heart. As the line goes, a song about the marvels and dangers of modern technology. It is also, as the ever handy Redditors point out, an anagram for BirthBot which is probably the name of the artificial womb Rusty invented to uh, gestate Hank and Dean. It's funny, though, that song is on Graceland, and it feels like all of the Simon and Garfunkel references in the show are Graceland, which is just so such a timestamp, I think, of like exactly the age that Jackson Public and Doc Hammer are. <laughs> it would have been earlier albums had they been older. Anyway... So the movie poster, I don't know if folks have seen it. It's beautiful. Go find the movie poster. It has the name of the episode on the side of the Venture Tech Tower building. And it's all very forced perspective. And I just said, this has got to be based on the Who is Scorpio title page by Jim Steranko. And then I looked it up and I was correct. So this is Jim Steranko, comic book artist and writer. Legendary. Who took, legendary, who took on the Nick Fury title and just suddenly, he, he was one of those, his style was like a whirlwind exploding at Marvel in many ways. He was one of, he was really the first artist who showed up with a wildly different style from the folks who were working there. Although he's certainly a big Kirby influence in his work, but like he was really doing something fresh and new. And I think anybody who likes the visual styles of the Venture Brothers cartoon would really like the visual style of Jim Steranko because he has so many of the mid-century aesthetic touch points, which were contemporary when he was doing it, are visible in his work, like all the pop art and op art stuff. Jim Steranko is all about that. So go check out his uh, classics comics from that era. He also there did some amazing stuff with uh, use, the use of negative space and surrealist imagery that mm -hmm. kind of brought a more countercultural vibe to Marvel in sort of the 60s and 70s, which is partly why Marvel took on older college-educated yeah. Yeah, yeah. College readership during that time. And uh, his, yeah, his Captain America comics were another, or really another good one to check out. Mm -hmm. There is a joke in the show about how no one goes to Queens, and I'm just here to say that's not true. People do go there. It's quite popular. 
I was surprised. I was like, I don't know. Everything's in Queens. What are they talking about? And to be clear, I don't even live there. I'm a Brooklyn person, of course. So the song that is auto-loaded onto the helper pod a la U2 and the iPod, for people who still remember that, oh, yeah. uh, is, of course, the Jackets uh, song, which is the only and hit <laughs> single by Shallow Gravy, which is Dermot and Hank's band. With Helper. With Helper as the... Drum machine, yeah. yeah. There is an amazing reference here. When, when the science team explains to Doc that there are so many th- features in the helper bot thing that the device is actually going to cost them more to make than what they were planning on selling it for. Mr. White, of course, makes a reference and he says, it's like your Blue Monday. Blue Monday is a really fantastic new wave song by New Order, the band that used to be Joy Division. Uh, it was released in 1983. You would probably recognize if you heard it. It's the How Does It Feel, that one. So that song, despite being the biggest selling 12 inch single of all time, like it just took just in, in England, like it, it sold just explosive. The record jacket, however, had was like black and it had all these shapes cut out of it. So you could see the colorful sleeve underneath. And because of the record jacket with the cutouts, it did cost more to, to release than it, than they made back. So despite the fact this was an incredibly fast growing hit album, the record packaging was that expensive that they still didn't make back the money from it. And of course, my brother, who's probably editing this and also the world's biggest new order fan was the one who pointed this out to me and, of course, said, I have a copy at Dad's. <laughs> like, of course you do. Anyway, and another thing that I recognized was the building on Canal Street where some poor hapless scientists of Ranadale Industries are working on doing some sort of science. I just recognized the look of that building. I, I've walked past it. That's a building on Canal. I don't have the specific one. The name of the company, Ranadale Industries, is a reference to the Latin word for frog, which explains why Brick Frog decided oh, to rob them. Oh, it's a themed heist. I like mm-hmm. that. That is, you know what? Say what you like about Brick Frog going all extreme 90s comics on us. But he does have that uh, attention to theme. Yes. <laughs> it is a 90s comics outfit. I love that. That's what the upgrades look like. So the sequence of Hank on the train is soundtracked by the song Small Town Boy by Scottish 1980s synth pop band Bronski Beat. Bronski Beat are a really significant band culturally. They were all out as gay in the early 80s, and they had songs and videos that dealt with homophobia and in politics more broadly. The video for Small Town Boy is like very cinematic. The video is directed by Bernard Rose, who is the filmmaker who directed the horror movie Candyman. The video features band member Jimmy Somerville riding a train from his small town, going to London, presumably, and thinking about how homophobia forced him to leave his hometown. It's a really touching video, and it's also a very literal music video. The gay bashing happens off camera, but the narrative is very clear as is the video's representation of queer male desire. And it has a happy, or at least hopeful, ending. In The Venture Brothers, Hank is positioned as Jimmy, and they actually do have a physical similarity, the cartoon character and the musician. Hank's story, however, does not involve surviving gay bashing. I think really the connective tissue here is it being a train sequence, and someone using that train to escape from their past life, reflecting on their life experiences. Um, but I hope, I hope this being in Venture Brothers gets more folks to check them out. We then have the fight or argument between the monarch and Gary over whether Toto or the police wrote, I, I think they're trying to decide who wrote Roxanne. And they was confused because Toto did write the song Rosanna. You know, while we do associate the police with light rock to an extent, I would also point out that they had a very significant influence on reggae and ska music in their sound. Oh, It came out of the punk scene. And they're a lot more hard-edged sounding than Toto. Toto is much more of a 
much more of a light rock band. This is the pre-Lute era of Sting, like back when <laughs> he still had some credibility on the English scene. And I shouldn't be too dismissive of, of Toto. Like they, they have pro, they have a prog rock influence and some jazz and stuff, but they just they sound very different. So I should give Toto another try, though. I'm get, I'm into dad rock, and so I should probably give them a, another I mean, try. Toto has some all time bangers like "Bless the Rain" down in Africa. That was their the big line. Hit. Mm-hmm. You know, those are karaoke classics for a reason because you just can't help singing along to them. Well, speaking of singing along, we now go to my definitely my favorite referency thing in this episode. We get it when the boys are watching an old movie clip of what may or may not be their mom. Turns out not, but it is a movie that is clearly based on the actual film Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, which is a Vincent Price vehicle where, of course, Vincent Price plays a mad scientist. And he uses a machine to create bikini bot women. Basically, in the, this is what that Mike Myers movie was like doing a riff on. He makes like robot bikini babes to take over the world. And the movie is very campy, but like very, it's like a deliberate camp. It was not a big success at the time, but not panned because it was self-consciously funny. And it has become a cult classic since. It has the same kind of animated, very 60s titles that are done with the sounds and narration over it as this fake trailer in the movie has. And the there is an amazing song that you can listen to that's Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, which is performed by none other than the Supremes, who were not oh yet the goodness. giant hit makers they became. So yeah, before the Supremes blew up, they were like actually one of the, l- the least well-performing bands on Motown, which is why they got stuck making the B-movie song. But it's a really fun B-movie song. The other thing referenced in that fake movie are definitely Hanna-Barbera's 60s cartoons where they have the gorilla drummer in the band because they've got gorilla drummers, but also just generally speaking, beach party movies of the 60s. A lot of those are put out by the same studio that did Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, which is American International Pictures. In the Venture Brothers show, they're calling it American Isotope Pictures, same acronym. And American International Pictures did a lot of beach movie gimmick movies are like fun and they're light, but they're like kitschy movies. So it's that kind of B movie. And I think specifically they are doing the beach party movie that had the Beach Boys on it because the song that the Beach Boys play with Annette Funicello is Monkey's Uncle, and which was written for the movie and is not a very good Beach Boys song. But, you know, I have, I, I'm a huge Beach Boys fan, so I say that with the sense of they have better. And you can go and you can watch Annette Funicello dance with Mike Love, full Republican nutbag. And the song is Mon- I'll Be a Monkey's Uncle. And is, that's like a very, it's like super villain. You got the monkey, the drummer. I don't know. They're all kind of with each other. But it's there were a lot. Silver Age DC Comics, yeah. Oh my God. Well, every, there's so many monkeys and you just can't, you can't have it any other way. But one of the th- cool things I wanted to note is the sound design in that scene because I was watching the movie with my headphones on and the sound design to sound changes when they're watching it on the laptop versus when you are in it watching it with them. So I had actually thought that my headphones had cut off, oh, but it was oh, not. It's the audio from the movie from Venture Brothers. They like specifically tweaked it so that it would sound like they were watching from a shitty laptop once you pulled out and were no longer in the screen with them. Which I thought was that a is crazy thing. attention to detail. It's such, yeah, exactly. That's just great attention to detail. So, yeah. But yeah, so the American Isotope Pictures, American International Pictures. In fact, I should say, Follow That Bikini, which is the name of the movie within the Venture Brothers. I think that name is a reference to Follow That Dream, which was an Elvis Presley movie. And then I probably making a joke on that is a movie, this is a Phil Silver's comedy called Carry On, Follow That Camel, which is a similar aesthetic visual look with its own title page and cards so so yes follow that bikini follow that dream follow that 60s nostalgia train that's right jumping into our different time periods we go to the new order of the triad headquarters which i am i knew that i'm like i know this synagogue this is the eldridge street synagogue of the lower east side the eldridge street synagogue which is the new home base that the order of the triad that they're customizing is 
was built in 1887. It was the first synagogue built to be a synagogue in New York City. So there were obviously shuls going back for a very long time, but they were just in repurposed buildings. This was the first shul that was like built with the designated purpose of being a shul. And it was a very important synagogue and a beautiful building. It is now a museum that you can visit. I probably should. This is also clearly a play on Dr. Strange's famous Bleecker Street. Sanctum Sanctorum. The Sanctum Sanctorum in the village, which like has a canon address and was a very kind of hippie, new agey neighborhood when Dr. Strange was first starting out in the comics. And it's now way too expensive for any hippie to afford. <laughs> well, um, interestingly, is but the, if you're of our generation, like the Lower East Side, where Eldritch Synagogue is, would have been the next phase of Bohemian Land. But by now, exactly, that whole area yeah. is crazy expensive too. And we would be doing this in Ridgewood, Queens, as I mentioned before about Queens. Anywho, so they encounter the Shmata Golem. So <laughs> the greatest thing Shmata I've ever seen. is Yiddish for basically like rags, garments, like low quality clothing, and very much kind of a touchback to uh, the long tradition of Russian, Polish, and Ukrainian Jews in New York City working in the garment trade. Yes. Yeah, the Shmata <laughs> trade being used to make the gold. Now, for our Goyasha listeners <laughs> who may not have heard this concept, uh, so the golem is a figure from Jewish folklore and mythology who is a clay statue brought to life by the rabbi of Prague who knows one of the secret names of God and uses it to bring the golem to life to act as the defender of the Jewish ghetto of Prague from an anti-Semitic pogrom. And I just want to recommend, if you've never heard of a golem before, there's a brilliant YouTube documentary by Jacob Geller called The Golem and the Jewish Superhero, which Mm. is this idea that the golem is the original Jewish superhero figure long before Siegel and Schuster and Kirby and Simon. And I also want to recommend... Terry Pratchett's Feet of Clay. Oh, so good. uh, Takes the Gollum myth and turns it into an amazing riff on robot uprisings, the Terminator, and the nature of sentience and free will. It's so good. I'll also mention that the 1928 movie, The Gollum of Prague, which is available to stream online and is... Very entertaining movie worth watching, silent movie. And it's, it's like, you certainly, Ben Grimm, like, totally looks like some of the golem art. So yes, it's all over the place here. Speaking of superheroes who are rags, there is, in fact, a ragman superhero. I love this sobriquet. Ragman, the Tatterdaemon of Justice, is a superhero appearing in a DC Comics which is obviously why I'm the one mentioning him and not Stephen. Make mine marble. <laughs> he was originally created. I know. He was originally created by Bob Kaniger and Joe Kuber in 76. Both, incidentally, are Jewish. Ragman was only subtextually Jewish. Originally, his name was Rory Regan, because we like to blur lines between crypto Irish, now actual Jews in comics. <clears throat> Cap- in America. Well. <laughs> but so, but he did become textually Jewish in 1991. They, when they revived the character, they revived him to have had Jewish heritage, his family name originally being Reganovich and having a direct family connection to the Golem of Prague. And this was in a mini series by Keith Giffen, Robin Lauren Fleming, Pat Broderick, and Anthony Tallinn, which I actually have. So he is a deep cut niche superhero, but I had to get him in there. I just love though that like the name of God is embroidered and on a sock. Yes. That's how the name of God works on the golem. So you just have to flip yeah. the sock on or off. And it's it's such a wonderful sort oh of God. mixture of the, the mundane and the miraculous in the same object. Perfectly said. So a little bit later, when Dr. And Mrs. the Monarch convenes the Council of 13, the 
Red Mantle and Dragoon uh, opened the meeting by complaining about the complexities of the MCU, although uh, given their complaint about Ike Perlmutter's attempt to make the Inhumans into the new X-Men, this is a much earlier uh, <laughs> iteration of the MCU. Unfortunately, there are a lot more movies and television shows to keep track of if you're an obsessive about continuity. But thankfully, if you are a comics uh, obsessive like myself, with the Fox merger, the, the MCU can have mutants, so Inhumans no longer has to be a thing. And now that the Marvel deal, Marvel Fox deal is done, Kamala Khan can be both an Inhuman and a mutant, as she always should have been. High Fidelity is based on a book by Nick Hornby. It's a movie, and then they are later a TV show, which I've joked as being like, oh, it's about somebody who has my taste in music. But I think it might actually be more narrow, in fact. he John Cusack vehicle, he is trying to <clears throat> talk to all of his exes to determine why they broke up with him. And I meant to see the Zoe Kravitz one, but I have not seen that. It is always appreciated to see depictions of Black women who like rock music in media, because that is underrepresented. Anyway... But the, apparently, if this had been a full season show, the idea was that Hank would go on a real f high fidelity, high fidelity storyline where he'd go and he'd interview all the women in his life or who hadn't been in his life or who almost were in his life to figure out what the deal was. Like he was going to go talk to the post woman who there used to be a thing about. He was going to talk to to his exes and everyone he thought might have been his mom, and that would have been one of the storylines for the season. I also heard that they were he want that they'd wanted to do a lot more with Serena this season, so it's unfortunate we won't get to see that. Yeah. So instead, Hank attempts to leave New York City, but in noir fashion. Unfortunately, instead of instead of jumping onto a tramp steamer, he jumps onto the Circle Line, which, if you are either a New Yorker or a tourist, is a sightseeing boat that goes around New York City in an actual circle. Hence, you cannot leave New York City on the circle line. You will just end up on the piers in lower Manhattan where you started, which <laughs> is a nice evocation of the episode's theme about moving on versus coming full circle. <laughs> a little bit later... Okay. A little bit later in the episode, Debbie asks... The monarch and Gary, what can Arch do for you? Which is an evocation of one of the most famous advertising taglines. What can Brown do for you from UPS? Uh, and I just wanted to take a second to congratulate the Teamsters on forcing uh, UPS to make enormous concessions uh, in what you know would have been uh, one of the biggest strikes in. Uh, U.S. history and is now one of the biggest, in terms of number of people covered, union contracts in American history. Really wonderful news. Yeah. While they're in the car driving to Chicago, I really was expecting there to be some sort of Blues Brothers thing happening, but there really weren't any Blues Brother references happening, which is surprising, but that's okay. What we do get is a really good pastiche of the song Jungle Boogie by Jungle Boogie by Cool and the Gang, which was also popularized in Quentin Tarantino movies. So mm -hmm. hopefully folks pick up on that one. It's a good song. So when Jefferson Twilight, Dr. Orpheus and Dean arrive in Chicago, uh, they are met by a gang of Blackulas who are an extended riff on the classic early 90s gangster film, New Jack City, which starred uh, Wesley Snipes as Nino Brown, the lord of the Cash Money Brothers gang in the Beret, who is looking to take over New York City. It's sort of Wesley Snipes' Scarface in terms of what it was trying to do for its image, ice tea plays opposite him as Detective Scotty Appleton, an undercover cop, trying to take down Nino Brown to avenge his mother. This one of the sort of 
first times that Ice T plays a cop, which would then turn into a multi-decade career <laughs> where he has played the same cop pretty much every week for the past 20 years. Wow. Other supporting characters, Chris Rock plays a street kid and informant called Pookie. And the director, Mario Van Peebles, plays Detective Stone, who is Ice-T's boss in the NYPD. The and movie sounds really all good. The different game. It is a classic internal affairs, undercover cop style movie, and has a great final showdown in a stairwell that I really remember. And of course, Wesley Snipes in the beret, the sort of early 90s fashion, very <laughs> much on display here. Very cool. So at the end of last season, Frank, my, my husband was like, okay, Lana, we have to watch Darkman so that you understand the end of that. And so we did watch Darkman. And uh, now I'm glad that I watched Darkman because Darkman is back in this season, in this show. And now I understand the reference. So it's a very campy, very over the top Sam Raimi movie. And Grey Fines plays, it's very much a fandom of the opera story. And, but it's but about a scientist and the uh, character who comes and meets up with the Order of the Triad, who's an old friend of Jefferson Twilight, is dressed as Dark Man in the movie. So we had the hint of the, so at the very the last scene from last season was a reference to the end of Dark Man, and then we have the actual character in this season. Mm -hmm. Also, we meet his neighbor, who is clearly a riff on the Punisher, except. Instead of merely having a skull logo on his chest, he has a full body skeleton attached to his arms and legs as well, which just highlights the inherent ridiculousness of the Punisher, who complains that they have blocked in his battle wagon, one of the actually in comic accessories that like the Punisher has had from the beginning is this like incredibly souped up armored panel van that is like a rolling armory weapons platform that the Punisher uses instead of a lair. So we then get to go and see a quick glimpse of Jeff Goldblum in The Fly, the Cronenberg movie. If you want to know what I have to say about The Fly, which I have a lot of different thoughts on, you can listen to the podcast, Progressively Horrified, where I am a guest for the episode called The Fly, aka Worst Person Olympics. So check out Progressively Horrified, really good horror movie podcast. If you want to hear me talk about the Cronenberg film, The Fly, the, the Jeff Goldblum one. We then get to hear a great countdown to a hit song from the 80s, It Takes Two by Rob Bass and DJ EZ Rock. I, I don't necessarily know why that was the song chosen to levitate the building. It is quite a jam. And it did, in fact, win this year's March Fadness Music Essay Writing Contest. So if you want to hear all about that, I can send you a link to an essay on it that won an award. I think in terms of the meaning of the selection of that song, the chorus is, it takes two to make a thing go right. It takes two to make it out of sight. Yeah, which is okay. a, yeah, it was just like a sample from a feminist funk song from the 70s. I want to rock right now and tell you that I think perhaps the two in the case of the story are... The, is Debbie courting, so to speak, Dr. Mrs. The Monarch? Like she's yeah, I can definitely see that. Proposing a team up through that song, perhaps. My best guess. Similarly, <laughs> in the scene where Dr. Mrs. The Monarch is briefed by Shirley Brock Sampson and the Red Death, and they tell her to run, is because she's been set up by Debbie to force her out of the guild is a reference to a very similar scene in Minority Report where Tom Cruise's character is set up with a, a fake recording that seems to pin a future crime on him, which kind of fits. We had previously been talking about Mission Impossible and similar kind of spy conspiracy thrillers. And either way, right, it's Tom Cruise running. 
as the building begins to take off, we see someone panhandling in a t-shirt that looks like a cross between a madman t-shirt and a reverse flash t-shirt, flash arch nemesis. And he has a tinfoil hat on, of course. We also see a uh, shipwreck saying three o'clock Brack of seagulls to try to get Brock to pay attention to the building taking flight on mm-hmm. flock of seagulls is an eighties new wave band that you could check out with a we then, haircut. They have really classic hair. They're, the most ubiquitous song would be I, I ran is probably the one you've heard. We then go to Billy quiz boy's house and I noticed that his mom seems to have a Picasso on the wall. It's an early period Picasso. So good for whomever stole that for them or copied it. This is, I believe, the second Picasso that we've seen in the series. So I'm not surprised. I mean, Doc Hammer is an amazing painter. I can see them having interest in having many painterly references in the settings. When Hank shows up at the animal refuge, he is intercepted by a gorilla that looks like the same gorilla from the earlier I'll be a monkey's uncle follow that bikini movie from earlier in the trailer. He is wearing a whoopee cap, which is a kind of hat you would recognize from Jughead from the comics, which was popular in the thirties. It was for among kids. It was made out of a cut up fedora hat. So it's just another level of the Hanna-Barbera. In fact, the giant seahorse that you see in the pool, I believe that seahorse is from the like, Thundar the Barbarian animated show, but I have not watched it, so I'm not sure. Yeah. So um, next, Judge John Hodgman's character in the OSI, whose name I've momentarily Snoopy. On. Snoopy. Sergeant thank you. Snoopy. References a very specific issue of the Fantastic Four as precedent for a building being launched up into space. This Fantastic Four number six, in which Doctor Doom lifts up the Baxter building into space with help from Namor the Submariner, which is famous for a couple reasons. One, it's the first time that Marvel Comics did a cutaway of the Baxter building and cutaway diagrams of the Avengers Mansion or the Xavier School or the inside of Spider-Man's web shooters and Cyclops' visors and similar things became like a staple of the official handbook of the Marvel Universe and classics nerd ephemera of the 1980s. Ultimately, the Fantastic Four are able to save the day because Namor has a change of heart and turns against Doctor Doom, which is a metaphor for both kind of how the monarch and Rusty himself are going to have a change of heart in Ventec Towers and come to do the right thing. The monarch has had, well, a cross between Professor X and and, and sometimes Magneto and sometimes Namor's eyebrows. So there's some of that visual to him going this whole time. We then get to visit the Isotope Pictures lot, which I believe looks like the Warner Pictures lot from real life. Warner Brothers was a relatively low budget studio, so it makes sense. And we, as we're visiting these, the studio in the 60s, we see Jonas Venture is there hanging out on the lot. Why is he there? Why he's talking to Stanley Kubrick. It's a really good Kubrick cartoon. And why is Jonas Venture talking to film director Stanley Kubrick? Well, clearly it's because they are working together to fake stage the moon landing. Yep. Sadly, a very long conspiracy theory that seems to never quite die are that some right wingers think that the moon landing was faked and that it was faked by Stanley Kubrick at the behest. I mean, obviously the evil Jews, because that's where it's our fault. Everything. I don't understand the theory of change they have behind this notion, but I did think it was funny to have Jonas Venture clearly be part of that consulting with with Kubrick about faking the moon landing. I laughed and I did not catch that the first time I watched the episode that was definitely something that was rewarded by a rewatch. Yeah, very much a blink and you'll miss it kind of thing. Um, well, it's funny. I noticed Kubrick, but I, I didn't think about why. Anyway, uh, my brain is a fascinating place. We then go and see our poor invisible Bobby become Debbie Does Dallas. That is definitely from the from a very famous softcore porn. She has a number of costume changes through there. And then when she finally meets 
her love to be force majeure, she is dressed as Dazzler, the X-Men character, who was originally supposed to be based on Grace Jones and done as like a disco queen. But publishers were racist and were like, no, she should be a blonde like Bo Derek in 10, which is well, a blonde with very cornrows. specifically. Yeah. Uh, the reason why she should be a blonde like Bo Derek is that Bo Derek was attached to play Dazzler in the multimedia marketing gimmick movie of Dazzler. And there's actually a Dazzler, the motion picture graphic novel. And Bo Derek's legendarily asshole-ish hmm. husband was attached to direct. And that's the reason why the movie fell apart, leaving Dazzler as the, in the comics as the only part of what was supposed to be like a simultaneous uh, album release movie and comic book franchise. Connor Goldsmith of Cerebral Cast has an excellent episode on Allison Blair Dazzler. If you want to yeah, it's really that. great. And we get all that from a quick little costume of her beautiful disco jumpsuit. Force Majeure, when he's hanging out in the 70s at whatever supervillain hangout, is dining with Divine, who is the famed muse drag queen of John Waters. She is wearing one of her outfits that looks very much one of the ones from Pink Flamingos, which is an essential piece of American cinema. One of the most important American movies. I'm not joking. Don't watch it with your children, though. He is also sitting with some other a couple of them seem like they might have been repeat villains. Stephen, you knew who one of them was. Yeah, so the guy sitting immediately between Divine and Force Majeure, I think is supposed to be Dr. Z, who is the Johnny Quest-style nemesis. Oh, that's um, right. He shows yes. up in the support group episode. Who is isn't now he, all, is, isn't he also on the council now? Yes, that he kind is. of Yeah. And there's a guy with a screw head. And a top yes. and a bowler cap. Help and us an figure out who it is. Guy. And I yes. don't exactly know what they're supposed to be references to, but they're way too specific not to be references. Yeah. So help us out if you guys know those. And then we get to visit Hank and Coma World. And guess who else visits Hank and Coma World? It's Zardoz, or I should say Sean Connery's character from Zardoz in the giant Zardoz head, with the giant Zardoz head being Jefferson Twilight's head. And I cheered. It is yeah, great reference to one of the weirdest movies of all time. When is it from? The 1970s, I believe. Yeah, but okay, so some point in the 70s. Yeah. I have to see it. I have I don't think you could have gotten away with making it in the 1980s. It's too <laughs> weird. The yeah. the penis is evil, the gun is good. Just would not fly in the Reagan era. Oh my god. What's so interesting is when we have Debbie and Sheila having at the beginning of their coming villain plan reveal, as it were, Red Death becomes the audience when he says, oh, I know what this reminds me of. This reminds me of the end of 16 Candles, which is the John Hughes movie from the 80s. I just thought it was so funny to have the supervillain be us in that scene, because we would have been the ones watching this happening and thinking, what is scene does this remind us of? And of course, the response that he gets for articulating this in real life is people saying, shut up, you're being irritating, sure. which I just think is funny because it's like, yeah. that's if we were watching them have that conversation in these positions and thinking, oh, it's 16 candles and saying it in real life, would other people think it was funny or would other people be like, Sh shut up? My friends, I think, would think it was funny, which is why I have friends who watch the show. <laughs> exactly. So Ventec Towers is ultimately saved by a fan favorite, the Ventronic combining robot, which is a sort of a loving homage to Sentai shows and Voltron, the idea of robots combining into a giant mecha that then saves the day, except instead of a giant sword, it's a clown head for one of the arms. And the whole idea is that everyone has to cooperate to save the day, and the monarch really doesn't want to. He's sulking until he like finally chooses to do the right thing. He also did get the clown head arm, which had yes. been that of the disabled brother. It's not a great character. Yeah, um, not a great running gag. No. But I literally screamed when 
they got the quick flash of the clown head when they determined that's what was that what that was. And I'm not even afraid of clowns. It was just such a good jump scare in the show. Yeah. It also is the monarch's clown head that spun off that knocked over the Jonas Venture statue that then impaled the monarch. It's not his fault. He didn't do anything wrong, but it is very the monarch that he was the cause of his own liver getting smooshed. Hoist by his own petard, so to speak. Dr. Orpheus tries to get a liver from another dimensional version of the monarch and doesn't really think about the implications of that. So there must be some parallel world with a liverless monarch. Yeah. And this is a trope of kind of multiverse and multiple dimension science fiction that like some of the dimensions, because they have slightly different physics, organs are reversed or in their position in the body, or they can't consume our food, we can't consume their food, and so forth. It pops up in Neil Stevens, Stevenson's Anathema, if I remember. Mm. When Dr. Orpheus is using magic to summon through the letters in Dean's chest, like, and it comes out in golden writing, did that remind you of Dr. Strange, how the Dr. Strange movie's magic worked? Yes, and like very specifically from Doctor Strange's appearance in Spider-Man No Way Home, mm-hmm. where he accidentally creates a, an interface between different dimensions through a spell going awry, which is similarly represented by glowing letters spinning in circles. Ah, there we go. We once more get to see the bizarre Doctor Isle of Dr. Moreau monkey character show up again, because he's with... Bob, who is a sweet man and a super scientist and looks like the dude from Big Lebowski coming in time to save the day in his van. Bob gives a watch of Jonas's to Hank and it's like a Rolex and he explains his significance. My husband is a bit of a watch nerd and was recognized that and was like, that watch is worth tens of thousands of dollars and actually estimated it to be a $20,000 watch once we wow. looked it up. Yeah. I so that was an ex- ever wanting yeah. that much money on my wrist. No. And that, well, it was because it was, if that watch wasn't vintage, it would still be a crazy amount of money, but it wouldn't be $20,000. Yeah. It's, it's the vintage that layered on top of that. But yeah. So quite the gift there. And then we get to the post credit sequence. I got so excited when we heard the helper bleeping, hush little baby, don't say a word, lullaby. So I think, I guess, I don't know that we talked that much about the specifics of Rusty being pregnant and all that in the show, but I think it's such an interesting taste of gender fuckery, like that he is their father and their mother. Yes, that's true. Yeah, it's a great I, there's an amazing quote from Jackson from, I don't remember which interview it was, saying all families are bizarre and artificial. And in this context where like we have the right wing insisting that there's only one way to be a family, and that's a fascist way to think about things, really and dangerous to people's lives. We literally are having people, like lesbian moms are getting removed from their child's birth certificates in Italy right now yep. by the TERFs who came to power pretending to be feminists. And feminists um, usually aren't like neo-fascists. Yes, usually not. And yet people are falling for it. And now there's literally like, I didn't think the face-eating tigers would eat my face, like actual lesbians in Italy who had supported the fascists and turfness are now like, oh, I guess they really do hate us. Yes, they do. Anyway, yeah. in, in, in a world where families that are not deemed to be the correct kind of family are being aggressively disassembled, by the forces of fascism in our government and in governments abroad as well. I really love that statement from the artists about the series. Agreed. So I I have to wonder what is next for this creative team? I I had thought that they were going to be like, okay, we're done with this and we're done, done. And I was feeling very, am feeling excited to see and hear what they decide to do next. It does sound like there is some interest from them in trying to do more of the show, but I was actually surprised to hear that, because I would have thought by now it'd be like, okay, we're ready to do the next thing. But they I spoke about after 20 years. And just, just in terms of final sort of thoughts on the movie, I do think this is a great wrapping up mm-hmm. of a 
20 year journey for the creatives and for ourselves. So I obviously, if there is more, I'd love to see it and I will happily continue along. But, you know, if this is where we have to leave it, I think we had a great run. Here, here. Yeah, I really look forward to seeing whatever they work on next. They're so brilliant. Oh, about the artificial uterus. One of the offensive jokes from an early season that was dropped was that, like, Mr. and Mrs. the Monarch was secretly a man and that she'd had a, I, I believe they said, a baboon's uterus. Oh, yeah. I don't remember exactly because that was very early in season one. Um, I, I think it might have been a baboon. And so it's interesting to go from like, you go from this transphobic joke or attempt at a joke. They think it's, I mean, it's a joke if you're a bigot. They go from a transphobic joke about baboon uteruses to ending the series with a cis man having an artificial uterus and having that being treated as really like nice and wholesome loving, and loving. Yeah. It's definitely a change. And then what part of a baboon? We get the baboon DNA and it's not on her. Really, one of the great things the show has done is everything with Dr. and Mrs. the Monarch. I mean, she began as a wordless character for a visual gag and then having the transphobic audio gag of her having this traditionally masculine sounding voice and then really has become one of the most complex and interesting characters in the series and always... And from that point, really with great dignity, and you can see how much better their writing became through that as well. Agreed. Any final thoughts, Stephen? No, I think I already summed it up. Well, that's it for us about this finale. If there is more Venture Brothers media to come, we'll be covering it. And I'm sure that we will be back at some point to do a couple of random past episodes, since you guys seem to enjoy when we do that. Stephen, where can our listeners keep up with your work online? So you can find me at racefortheironthrone.wordpress.com or racefortheironthrone.tumblr.com. Uh, I'm weaning myself off of Twitter, but you can find me at Stephen Atwell on Blue Sky. And I'm on Blue Sky as Levin, L-E-V-I-N. I'm still on Twitter, <laughs> but less, much less than I used to be. More than I should be, but much less than I used to be. At E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. We'll be having more episodes of the show coming up, talking about some amazing new comic series. And I want to thank everybody for your ongoing support and patience with the show and the timelines of production. I love making this show for you. I'm glad I can do a better audio quality, but it does mean that this takes more work to put out. So I appreciate everyone's patience. If you like this podcast, please tell your friends, please share it. Our home is at Graphic Policy. And as we like to say, go, go Team, Team Venture, Venture Brothers, Brothers Podcast. I don't think we're ever going to be able to do it without like video. I could have actually done it. Yeah, no, I just, but I mean, like, we, I don't think we've ever successfully managed synchronicity. Oh, no, that was the joke. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.